Hello to all my queers and dears, and welcome back to my Adam Writes an Essay series. This time, in anticipation of the unexpected return of Max Caulfield as the protagonist in the newest Life is Strange game, Double Exposure, we are going to be digging into the Dunaragonist from her first time around, and trying to analyze and explore why there's so much polarizing discourse around her, as well as examine some of the reasons she is who she is. And who she is, is Chloe motherfucking Price. She's angry, she's blunt, she's petulant, she's impulsive and reckless, she's often selfish or rude, and for many people, that's all they can see. Or perhaps it's simply all that matters to them. Chloe is quite a divisive character. Not as divisive as, say, Abby from The Last of Us Part Two, that is a high bar after all, but plenty divisive in her own right. She's had huge videos made about how bad a friend she is, how frustrating she is, how toxic she is, etc. But what happens when we look past the surface? Life is Strange as a series encourages a practice of doing so. You can only save Kate if you pay attention to who she is and what she's going through. You can only get through to Victoria by understanding why she acts the way she does. And you can only recognize the tragedy of Nathan Prescott when understanding how his father's cruelty imparted a desperation to measure up to extremely toxic notions of masculinity in order to earn any kind of respect from a male authority figure, leaving him open to the manipulation of a man like Mark Jefferson, as well as how Sean Prescott actively disregarded and demeaned Nathan's serious and increasingly severe mental health struggles. And that's just characters in the Arcadia Bay games. Every character in Life is Strange is a full person. Or almost every character. Chloe is no different. And while every character I just listed deserves their own essay, this one is focused on her. So let's talk about who Chloe is, why she is that way, and how people treat her and how people talk about her. Some disclaimers. While I'm aware that not everyone will agree with this approach, in this analysis, I will be treating Before the Storm as equally canon to LIS-1. I am aware there are plenty of continuity snafus, some large and some small, but to me, the character work it does is too important to let those continuity incongruities stand in the way of its canonicity. Ultimately, the fact is, I am going to be analyzing Chloe's complete story as told by both the original game and its prequel. If you don't like that, well, it's what I'm doing, so you know what you're getting but I do hope you'll stick around even if you disagree with that approach. I also want to make it clear that while I know Chloe having borderline personality disorder is a fandom read some of you may be expecting me to talk about here, I will not be doing so for a few reasons. First, it's not confirmed in the text, and while this doesn't make the read less valid, it does make it less useful in this specific essay. Second, that's already talked about at length in Game Assist essay The Price of Life, which I cannot recommend enough. It will be linked below along with Lost and Fair's video, No One Likes a Mad Woman. Both of these essays are mandatory viewing for fully appreciating Chloe's character, in my opinion. But the analysis of how Chloe is treated both in and out of story through the lens of disability and gender is not going to be the main focus of this essay, though we will touch on it briefly. Side note, if you're a patron, I'll be sharing a playlist of my favorite Life is Strange essays there very soon, if not have already done so by the time this is out. Third, and most importantly in my opinion, I am not part of that community, do not know anyone in that community, and therefore do not have any right or the necessary knowledge to speak on that reading of Chloe in any meaningful capacity. If I were to make a video on that, I would very much want to get voices more qualified than mine involved. This video is focused on the text of the games and on breaking down why Chloe is who she is, trying to clear up some misconceptions, debunk some of the more hostile reactions to her, and get you thinking about Chloe from angles you may not have considered. Some content warnings as Life is Strange touches on a lot of very difficult topics, and Chloe's life is chock full of them. This video will include discussion about suicide and self-harm, physical and emotional abuse, drugs, abandonment trauma, war trauma, toxic families, anxiety, ableism, misogyny, and death. Without further ado, let's dig in. Adam Myers and Adam Splitter's Entertainment present Defending Chloe Price, a study of character and context. We should probably talk a little bit about the misogyny and ableism that comes into discussing a character like Chloe. 
When female characters aren't likable, they tend to receive particularly hostile, or at least divisive, reactions. Mabel from Gravity Falls, Abby from The Last of Us, Cora from The Legend of Korra, Skylar from Breaking Bad, and I'm not saying these characters or even the handling of them are not worthy of criticism. However, the social bias is undeniable, because these characters don't just get criticism, they get full-on, unfiltered hate. And maybe you and my audience aren't one of the people who harasses the creators or actors, and I'm really very happy you're not, but that doesn't change the reality that that happened, and that female characters are regularly held to higher standards than male characters, just like real women are in comparison to men. Also, I am using the terms women and men here, but of course, it's also important to recognize that a lot of this stuff applies to people who present femme and present mask, but that's not something I want to go into in huge detail here, and ultimately the gender norms are centered around the ideas of women and men, so that's what I'm focusing on. However, I just want people to know that I am aware that these things apply to people that do not fit into that gender binary. It ultimately doesn't matter whether it's unconscious or not, these slanted reactions are the product of ingrained and systemic misogyny. That doesn't mean you're an active misogynist, but it does mean you grew up internalizing certain gender norms. So women and femme-presenting people, by virtue of these norms, are rarely given the grace to be messy or flawed or loud or angry. They are not provided tolerance for them taking up space. Let's compare Chloe to Kate Marsh, for example. Kate Marsh is what is sometimes called a cinnamon roll character, tailor-made to be loved. She's sweet and innocent and kind and never takes her pain out on anyone. Most people adore her, and cards on the table, I'm one of them. But she is what is sometimes called a perfect victim. Chloe, meanwhile, is a decidedly imperfect victim. She's hurting, and she doesn't hide it for the comfort of others. So yeah. She's not always the most likable person. And? I mean, we live in a world where the most famous superhero in the world is, to be frank, an asshole. But Tony Stark is also a man, and he's played by an actor with boatloads of charisma, so when he lashes out at people or casually insults them, it's fun for us, I suppose. But when Carol Danvers comes in and she's a little bland, she's the target of years upon years of vitriol, because she wasn't likable. We all need to unlearn that bias. Characters do not have to be tailored to your preferences to have interesting stories worth telling about them. And women do not lose their value when they start centering their own pain or expressing emotions that are considered unappealing. This coincides with ableism because mental health struggles are treated differently depending on one's gender and gender presentation. Women, and those perceived as women, are often expected to struggle in silence or at least to be unobtrusive with their pain. Kate Marsh is a perfect victim because she is pure and wholesome and innocent, and no one could ever reasonably argue that she deserves any pain or unhappiness. But Chloe can be frustrating. Her impulsiveness and lack of filter often lead her into big trouble, and by extension, those in her orbit. She's often selfish. She often lashes out unfairly. So even though her pain is just as deep as Kate's and is just as valid, some people seem to feel that she doesn't deserve the same empathy that is given to someone like Kate. Some feel this subconsciously, others are more explicit. For this essay, I ask you to put aside whether or not you like Chloe Price, and let's get to analyzing this wonderful, messy, complicated, angry, loud, sometimes exhausting, but always exciting, blue-haired punk. It's worth examining who Chloe is when she's younger, before her father William was killed in a car crash, and before Max moved across the country and lost touch. Knowing who Chloe is at this younger age is important in order to understand how she became the iconic blue-haired, tattooed punk that we meet in the first game. We don't spend all that much time with Chloe at this age. Only the bonus episode of Before the Storm and the brief sequence in Chapter 3 of LIS 1, where Max's future self travels back in time to her younger self and saves the life of Chloe's father William. That does mean that this section will be a bit shorter than some of the others. But even so, we're not lacking in information about this time in Chloe's life, 
as it is key to all her relationships in the present day stories of Life is Strange and Life is Strange Before the Storm. Specifically, there are a couple primary dynamics that Chloe relied on when she was young that either deteriorated or disappeared entirely, planting the seeds for the brash and angry girl we are familiar with. First is her relationship with her parents. In general, it's made clear how deep Chloe's relationship with her father went. Max even observes as much when she goes back to save William's life. And of course, Chloe writes about it in her journal as well. We don't know as much about her relationship with her mother Joyce at this time, but from the context of their relationship as seen in the present, it seems like, while it's certainly deteriorated since, it was never as strong as the one between Chloe and William. Max even observes that their dynamic is similar to when she left, so that does not bode well for how it was before William died. When William dies in the car crash, Chloe loses the one adult who truly put in the effort to understand her. And even though she knows objectively what happened to him was a senseless random tragedy, emotionally her 13-year-old self still registers it as him walking out the door and never coming back. You blame William? Really? Yes, I do. Damn right. He chose to go out that door and leave me forever. Chloe, your dad didn't choose to leave you. I know that, Max. My mom actually blames herself. Just because she wanted a ride home from work. Sometimes, even I blame her. No, you don't. Yes, Max, I do. Do you know what it's like to wait for your father to come home when you're a kid? And he never does? No, of course not. But I was with you that day. It was just a terrible accident. I wish that made me feel better. But ever since he died, my life has been dipped in shit. Second, and equally important, is her relationship with Max. When Chloe and Max were young, they played pirates. A lot. <laughs> it was a genuinely significant and important part of their friendship, and it gets a lot of mentions throughout Max and Chloe's stories, respectively. It's a good baseline for the dynamic we see them fall into in the first game. Chloe's nicknames for Max, like Super Max, constantly and consistently indicate Chloe's endless love for her and her trust in her. Chloe is often brash and impulsive, and certainly doesn't always listen when Max tries to pull her back, but Chloe is fully aware that Max has a better head on her shoulders when it comes to making decisions, and that seems to have always been the case. Absolutely. You make me feel like I know what I'm doing. And you make me feel like I have a reason for still being in Arcadia Bay. I hope so. Stop being so goddamn humble. You're like the smartest, most talented person I've ever known. More than Rachel Amber? Dude, I'm not her groupie, okay? And I'm sure you have Blackwell bros all over you. Like Warren. Chloe often knows that the thing she's doing or saying is harmful or just wrong in some way, but her impulsiveness and her, frankly, far too eroded ability to care about the rules of society often require Max to be her voice of reason. Meanwhile, Chloe pushes Max to get out of her shell to stop retreating inward every time something gets a little uncomfortable, and to try and actually embrace the person Chloe sees in her. That's why they have such a deep relationship. They genuinely push each other to be their best selves just by existing in the same space. In the years after her father dies and Max moves across the country, Chloe develops a lot of very bad habits. She's buying drugs to dull the pain, she smokes, she lashes out at everyone, she is almost impulsively rude, she puts herself in risky and even outright dangerous situations constantly, and she pisses off people she really, really shouldn't. There is some value to her willingness to frankly not give a crap. Rachel Amber, being someone who often puts on a performance for others, is drawn to Chloe being truly real. Max, meanwhile, as mentioned above, is inspired to take more risks and push herself to do more with her life. But even so, overall, Chloe is fully embraced disregarding and even outright sabotaging her own health, safety, and needs without any thought given to the consequences. The worst part? She knows all of this. And she can't stop. Totally. Your parents love me. They're good at coming off that way, but don't let your guard down. And, Chloe, we just need to make it through dinner. Try not to say anything that, you know... That I would normally say. Exactly. 
By before the storm, Colby's life has gotten really bad. Arcadia Bay is almost a character in and of itself in Chloe's story. She essentially sees Arcadia Bay itself as the enemy and escaping it to be her salvation. This makes sense because, frankly, everyone in Arcadia Bay failed her. Like I said, emotionally, Chloe registered William as walking out the door and never coming back. She knows that's not what happened, of course, but it doesn't change how her young mind was emotionally impacted. Only a couple of years later, her mother starts seriously dating a traumatized war veteran who not only expects Chloe to do everything he says without question or complaint, leaning heavily into gaslighting and condescension, but he also actively disrespects and invalidates her at every turn. And Joyce, Joyce is awful. I'm sorry. Not that she's an awful person. I deeply sympathize with what she's dealing with. She's in severe financial distress, she's suddenly a single mother, she's got a teen who's acting out, and she starts dating a man that brings a bit of order to her life. It's a very reasonable desire in that situation. But Joyce fails Chloe, truly spectacularly, because no matter how awful David is to Chloe, Joyce always puts the blame on her daughter. Joyce repeatedly puts the responsibility on Chloe to make the three of them quote, a real family, often citing David's military service or trauma from the war as justification for telling Chloe to be nicer to him, even when he makes no effort to genuinely change or see where she's coming from. Chloe understands she just needs time. I know that sucks for you. Oh, she hit all the phases. Expulsion, running away, drugs, bad boys, tattoos, piercings, blue hair. <laughs> Now she's got to rebel against her stepfather. I see why, I mean. Do you? He's not as much of a hard ass as you think. Joyce, he slapped Chloe yesterday. He feels awful, and he will be punished. But Chloe does push David, and it's not fair. He paid his dues in a war. He does care about her, along with all the students at Blackwell. Joyce tells Max in Life is Strange 1 that Chloe chose to stay angry. But quite frankly, how is a teenage girl supposed to heal from feeling abandoned when her own mother in her own household repeatedly abandons her to take the side of a man who is actively cruel to her? I heard the whole sordid story from David. I'm sorry this was how you had to meet him. He's a good man, no matter what Chloe says. Yeah, I'm sure. I don't even smoke, like, ever. It was almost an accident. It was very stupid. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, it surprised me fierce. I was hoping you could be a good influence in her life now. I will be. Promise. I know things were hard for you and Chloe. I feel bad I didn't call. Now my folks are in Seattle and I'm all alone at Blackwell. It's my karma. You did the right thing. You moved forward with your life. I did after William passed on. Chloe? Chloe chose to stay angry. Anyway, I hope we see more of you. Chloe needs an old friend again. Joyce, I am so sorry about William. I have great memories of him. I'm glad, Max. That was his gift to us. Wonderful memories. Even if Chloe doesn't understand yet. This language is also quite familiar to anyone who's familiar with ableism's greatest hits, referring to an undesirable aspect of the disabled person as an act of choice that they can be blamed for, thus alleviating all others from the responsibility of having to treat them with respect or support them in any way. Concerning Chloe getting kicked out of Blackwell, we know Chloe is brilliant, she did get into Blackwell after all, but like many students, she faces the reality that most schools aren't built to give her the space or care required when she's not able to be the ideal student, and is punished for it. And it's true, Chloe is not a good student. Her diary indicates it mainly started with skipping classes, an ultimately non-disruptive rebellious act. It's also a clear sign that something is up, but instead of offering support and understanding, Principal Wells shames her for not measuring up to his standards. These acts of rebellion result in a drop in her reputation. So she's sabotaged and demonized even when she's not in the wrong, just because she doesn't put forth the image Blackwell wishes to depict of its students. This, along with blatant classism, 
is fully on display when she's accused of bullying Nathan Prescott just for being in the vicinity where he was being bullied. So why should she even try to uphold that image Blackwell wants of her? Chloe is a messy, complicated person. She shouldn't be punished by the school for that just because they are uncomfortable with the way it appears to the public. Everyone who should have been supporting a spiraling, grieving teenage girl instead labeled her as a problem child and a lost cause. Chloe was being gaslit from every direction by people that believe that her inability to heal is her fault. And, heartbreakingly, part of her believes it. Most of the main criticisms of Chloe that I've seen tend to be focused on her selfishness. And yeah, she is selfish. But it makes sense. After everything she's been through, she wants to be prioritized. This tends to be the area in which Chloe's divisiveness thrives. I think for a lot of people, it sort of comes down to how much you relate to her. I hated Chloe on my first playthrough, but years later, well, let's just say I understood her pain a little more by that point. And I really understood how without a safe environment in which to heal, that kind of pain and trauma would have festered in me the same way it did in Chloe. I felt that same anger, that same frustration at the lack of closure and the unfairness of what I was dealing with. But unlike Chloe, I had an environment in which to process and deal with those feelings properly. As usual, Chloe expresses her needs poorly. The big moment a lot of people point out is if Max answers Kate's call in Two Whales Diner, Chloe gets upset. Max acknowledges this in her journal. She's not fond of Chloe's petulant side, and it's clear Chloe's abandonment issues have made it harder for her to accept that Max may have other friends that sometimes pull her attention away from Chloe. It's also worth noting that Chloe has no idea what Kate is going through when she reacts this way. Admittedly, she isn't the best at slowing down and considering the lives of others, but still, she has no reason to think at that moment that Max not taking that call could have such dire consequences. As such, I personally don't think it's fair to treat her like she intentionally told Max to not console a depressed friend when she didn't even know who Kate was, let alone how depressed she had been. If Kate survives and Max goes to visit her in the hospital, the player sees Chloe filled with regret over this. Just go in there and be your friend. I'll wait out here so you can chill by yourselves. I was a total dick for blowing a fuse when you answered Kate's call the other day. Good thing you ignored me. I had no idea what shit she was going through. And you saved her. Like me. I'm sorry. I imagine she is in the other timeline too, because it would be very odd and out of character for her to feel regretful only in the timeline where Kate survives. But unfortunately, the scene where Chloe reflects on this is when Max visits Kate in the hospital, which means there's no equivalent scene in the timeline where Kate died. I do recognize that Chloe does actively dismiss Kate either dying or almost dying in the conversation with Max in her truck that I played a clip from earlier, but that doesn't necessarily prove that she doesn't feel regret or anything of the sort. She's just in a very angry place right then, and in that moment she wants her own pain validated rather than focusing on anyone else. It's not necessarily a indicator of her feelings in general. Max tends to get a lot of slack when talking about Chloe because of a variety of reasons, though that's for another essay, but her flaws are extremely important to who Chloe became in her absence and should not be overlooked. Not so long after her father's death, when Chloe needs support most, Max, her best friend and let's be honest her soulmate, moves across the country and utterly fails to stay in touch in any meaningful way. Max is conflict avoidant to the extreme and second guesses everything. She consistently fails to submit her photos to the Everyday Heroes contest because she can't see the value in her photos that her own teacher tells her he, the person who will pick the winner, can see. Every single time, every single time that the player makes any decision, Max thinks to herself that the opposite decision could be better even when it's apparent that the decision would only result in similar concerns. Hey, why don't you leave her alone? Excuse us, this is official campus business. Excuse me, you shouldn't be yelling at students or bullying them. Hey, hey, nobody is bullying anybody. I'm doing my job. No, you're not. 
You're part of the problem, Missy. I will remember this conversation. Oh, Max, that was great. I think you scared him for once. I, I have to go, but thank you. It means a lot. Anytime, Kate. I felt like an everyday hero helping Kate, but now Officer David Dickhead is after me. Maybe I should rewind and mind my own business? Max's inner thoughts are absolutely plagued with doubts and insecurities. Max is even directly called out for often not getting involved in any real way, often preferring to stay in the role of observer that she is so much more comfortable in, which is part of the reason photography appeals to her so much. She's just more comfortable being outside looking in. Well, from what I could find, it's never stated explicitly, the repeated writings in Max's journal about not knowing what to say to Chloe after five years, them being strangers to each other, and the guilt Max feels from dropping out of contact heavily imply that because she moved away, and her relationship to Chloe became complicated, she simply avoided dealing with it. From there, she felt guilty for avoiding it until it became more complicated, leading to her avoiding it even more, and round and round we go. This, along with other factors discussed in the previous section, create a serious challenge for Chloe to navigate in any friendship or relationship Chloe might have, because she exists in a constant state of waiting to be let down again. She didn't choose to stay angry, like her mother says. She's just in the mindset of constantly playing defense against the world because she's afraid of not being prepared the next time someone hurts her. Again, Chloe knows exactly what she's like, she just can't stop. She's developed too many unhealthy coping mechanisms and has no safe environment in which to unlearn them. It's very important to understand that Chloe does not like herself. She does not like that she pushes people away or that she is often selfish or rude. The things people criticize her for are acknowledged in the game as traits worth criticizing, including by Chloe. Booyah! Get it? Booyah. Like I'm a scary punk ghost. More like a scary and sensitive asshole. Chloe, I watched my friend jump off a roof today. I don't think you need to prank me tonight. You always trip out on me for not being there for you, but is this how you're there for me? I'm... I'm sorry, Max. I, I wasn't even thinking. I suck. I'm not trying to be a bitch, but... I'll never get the image out of my head of Kate jumping off that roof. All because my power didn't work. It didn't mean shit. I know seeing Kate fall was horrible. I don't even know how to deal with that, so I just... act like an idiot. But it's your badass power that's gonna bring all this to a close. We just need to connect the players. What we literally argue was in the finale of Life is Strange 1 that the other people in Arcadia Bay deserve to live more than she does. And while she is technically being selfless, it's not a heroic act so much as one clearly born from a place of deep self-loathing. When Max first asks Chloe about her relationship with Rachel, Chloe calls Rachel her angel and says she saved her life. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say Chloe was probably experiencing some suicidal ideation before Rachel came along. The implications are certainly there, and they are heavy. Like I said in the previous section, her recklessness and impulsivity also often put her in unnecessary, perilous situations, indicating a disregard for her own safety that definitely implies a lack of value placed on her own life. One could even argue that the story of Life is Strange 1 centers around Max caring more about Chloe's life than Chloe does. There's so many more people in Arcadia Bay who should live. Way more than me. Don't say that. I won't trade you. This essay was initially called The Controversial Chloe Price, A Character Study. But as I wrote it, I realized that this wasn't just about her character, but also about putting that character in the relevant context both in her world and ours. And it was also about defending not her actions or attitude, but the legitimacy of where those actions and that attitude come from, and why that makes her so interesting and worth more than complaints or controversy. Chloe isn't the worst best friend, or the best best friend. 
She's selfish, yet she's the key to building Max's confidence through unconditional love and support. She's brash and often rude, but always real and uncompromising. She is cynical and jaded, yet cares deeply about the impact of her selfishness on others when the bill comes due. Chloe Price is a mess of contradictions and complexities, and that makes her utterly fascinating to me. She's such an incredible depiction of how unhealed trauma festers in an unsafe environment. She's also, frankly, an amazing depiction of how female and femme survivors of abuse and structural violence that make their pain known rather than suffer in silence are treated. Consider the way Britney Spears acting out was treated, for example. She was mocked, demonized, stereotyped, and no one cared what she was going through. Or Amber Heard, who regardless of how you feel about her or the outcome of the case, became a public spectacle and the target of countless misogynistic attacks and accusations of lies, manipulation, and other malicious intent, not due to evidence, but through pseudoscience like body language analysis. Side note, no matter who was guilty, that trial was none of the public's goddamn business, and Johnny Depp and his lawyers pushing for it to be broadcast to the whole world was an obscene, disgusting, horrible thing to do. This makes it so that the discourse and division around Chloe are, as I hope I've made clear, actually important to examine in the context of structural misogyny and ableism just as much as anything else. And again, I implore you to go watch The Price of Life and No One Likes a Mad Woman. Both of those focus more on the ways cultural and systemic treatment of gender and disability inform Chloe's story than I was able to get in this particular essay. We should not entertain the notion that quote unquote bad people are somehow less deserving of understanding, because with that, people like Chloe who are identified as problems for those around them get that much needed empathy robbed from them. Vera Wilde of Council of Geeks put it wonderfully in their recent video on stan culture. Don't be an asshole. And I know that sounds oversimplified, but like, I mean it emphatically. Because the truth is, you know when you're being an asshole. You do. You, you, you do. But the thing is, there will be circumstances under which you have convinced yourself, oh, but it's okay because. And the most common one is, it's okay because this is a bad person who deserves it. You don't need to like a person like Chloe Price. You don't need to not call out when they're being petulant or unfair. You just need to understand them. You need to see them for who they are and what they've been through. You need to see their humanity and you need to act accordingly. People are who they are for a reason. And people like Chloe don't deserve the kind of pain she endures or the self-loathing she is taught to accept. Chloe isn't everyone's cup of tea, and that's okay. Just don't be an asshole about it. First, I want to say thank you to my one paying patron, Ven364. You've been incredibly patient with me as I figured this whole Patreon thing out. I know I haven't done a particularly good job with Patreon, but I hope some of the tweaks I'm making will help. Also, thanks to all the sources of the Life is Strange footage used in this video, credit given in the description. Huge thanks to my friend and editor Bardock, couldn't do this without ya. Thanks to everyone in my incredible Discord community Adam Plays a Host, who have all supported me as I wrote this and helped me fine tune it. Links in the description to my socials and Bardock's as well as other relevant links like my Patreon and the GoFundMe for my audio drama Nightstones. If you enjoyed or found this video useful, you can check out my other essays via the links at the end of this video or the playlist in the description. Or, if you have the financial capacity, you can join my Patreon at $1 a month or $3 a month. I'm hoping to move into a new apartment soon so I could really use your support. For $1 a month, you'll get shoutouts at the end of my videos. And at $3 a month, you'll get access to older works of mine no longer listed on my channel, sneak peeks of upcoming essays and projects like the recently released music from my upcoming audio drama Nightstones, or notes I'm making for upcoming scripts, as well as get a link to my Discord server along with securing the patron role. There will also be an update video releasing at some point in the near future for the general approach to Patreon I have as well as some of the perks, including a really exciting one, so keep your eye out for that. I've got essays in the works on Abigail Thorne's The Prince, Redemption Arcs, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, 
so-called perfect stories acting as the bar for other stories to reach, and more. So if you want to see any of those, or any reactions, commentaries, or interviews I'm working on, make sure to subscribe to catch them when they come out. 81% of people in my audience aren't subscribed, so please do as I would really love to start making money on this work by the end of the year, and frankly, the support just means the world to me. Other than that, leave a like if you liked the video, dislike it if you didn't, give your thoughts in the comments, give me feedback, or hell, just comment some gibberish for the algorithm, and I'll see you all soon.